Warm greetings from the Society of Dyes and Colorists. SDC is happy to partner with Pratibha Syntex and NSF International for this webinar. I welcome you all. And uh, this webinar is on uh, the rise of regenerative agriculture and opportunities in sustainable material sourcing. The regenerative organic certification is the highest global standard for agriculture. Adopting regenerative or organic practices on farms can create long-term solutions to some of the biggest issues the world has been facing, including the impact of climate crisis, safety in food and farming systems, factory farming, and the fractured rural economies. So this platform was necessary to spread the information to protect the future of the supply chains. I'm privileged to welcome and introduce each of our speakers today. Ms. Nova Sayers, uh, Mr. Atul Mittal, and Mr. Avinash Karmarkar. Our first speaker today will be Ms. Nova Sayers, Senior Manager, Business Development and Sustainability at NSF International. In the last four years, NOAA has successfully launched several innovations to foster trust and sustainability. She also engages in many industry initiatives for regenerative businesses and sustainability, including the Sustainable Food Trade Association, the Sustainability Consortium, the Carbon Farming Working Group, and a farm grant fund called Collective, Collective, Cultivating Change. From her talk, you will know how passionate she is about building integrity, health, and sustainability in our food and agriculture system in a way that creates value for brands, suppliers, and consumers. We would like to understand more on how regenerative agriculture movement evolved and regenerative organic certification and its framework. The second speaker will be Mr. Atul Mittal, Director Pratibha Syntex, a textile professional with more than three decades in the industry, a highly disciplined and driven individual aspiring to create synergies between business and farming. He has been instrumental in creating various success stories on a broad spectrum of textile businesses. Passionate for technology and innovation, Atul loves to create new ways of doing things. So Pratibha Syntex has backed the Global Supplier Award from CNA. Recently, they have undergone ROC certification during the pilot phase. So ROC has given a new direction to Atul and he is now focused on leveraging its potential with and will be sharing their on the ground perspectives and experiences. I also welcome Mr. Avinash Karmarkar, Vice President, Project Vasudha, a farm division of Pratibha Syntex. With seven years of experience, he has been looking after the training, development, certification of organic, fair trade, and ROC farmers. A model organic farm that he has been improvising on the cotton, soil technology, and the eco balance. ROC farms and products meet the highest standards for soil health, animal welfare, and farm worker fairness. We look forward to your experiences in bringing about a reversal in farming. If you could share the possibilities uh, and challenges in adopting and implementing ROC, it would benefit the participants here. I would now welcome Dr. Rashmi Chakravarti, who is South Asia Business Development Manager, to just tell us a brief about NSF. Over to you, Rashmi. 
your audio. Thank you, Dr. Suman. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for moving this slide. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for your time today evening. It's a pleasure to have you all here in this webinar. I am Rashmi Chakravarti, South Asia BDM at NSF International. I would take a few minutes of your time to introduce NSF International. Founded in 1944 at the University of Michigan's School of Public Health, uh, NSF has not grown up as NSF International globally. We are uh, having a we are a non-for-profit corporation having regularity and legal rela relationship with international federal, state, and local bodies. Our mission is to protect and improve human health and the environment. We serve to 20 plus industry sectors and our services include uh, to food, water, health science, ISO, and sustainability consultancies. We also do pro uh, consumer products and provide services in, for testing, inspection, certification, training, consulting, and standard development. Can I have next slide, please? You, we can see the footprint of NSF uh, globally. NSF provides services in 175 plus countries with 57 offices and laboratory locations. We have 2,800 plus experienced professionals with us to serve our client globally. Next slide, please. Along with the uh, other services, we have the sustainability services, which is capable of providing many, uh, many services uh, to our clients like responsible sourcing, responsible sourcing, risk analysis and consulting. We also do textile certification services, textile certification like GRS, Global Recycle Standard, RCS, Recycle Content Standard, uh, OCS, Organic Content Standard, Responsible Wool, respon Traceable Down, and uh, etc. We also provide uh, chemical management and evaluation services, uh, which, are, uh, which includes safer chemistry, clean gradient, and safer choices. NSF Sustainability Division also provides services of claim verification, which includes EPD, recycled content, and uh, non-toxic content verifications. We also have sustainable and environmental system certification process uh, certification services, which includes ISO 14001, ISO 9001, and OHSOS 18001. Next slide, please. Along with these services, next slide. NSF also provides regenerative organic services and we also manage ROC certification. So today, uh, let's move to today's topic, the rise of regenerative agriculture and opportunities in sustainable material sourcing. I would like to invite Nova Sayers, our expert of region agriculture to to uh, discuss the detail in detail about regeneration importance, regenerative principles, the emerging regenerative market, and ROC certification. Over to you, Nova. Yeah, thank you so much, Rashmi, for organizing this webinar, and Dr. Suman, and I'm honored to be able to share this information with everyone today at the Society of Dyess and Colorists. So I came here to speak about an opportunity, and it's an opportunity to create a brighter future for agriculture, but also for the industries that depend on it, like textiles and food and so many others. It's an opportunity that promises to protect nature and improve livelihoods in farming communities, not just in South Asia, but around the world. And it feels to me that now more than ever during this pandemic, our interdependence and the need to create system-wide change is becoming really clear. Fortunately, we've been able to see that governments, NGOs, companies especially, can cooperate during a crisis like this to make changes that might have seemed impossible before. And that gives me hope. Over the next decade, we need to amplify that kind of cooperation 
to deal with other major global risks that we're facing, like climate change and the loss of natural resources. And as it turns out, which we'll discuss today, agriculture could be very fertile ground for that kind of cooperation. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to take a moment to set the context. You might be wondering what happened to the word sustainability and why are people using this term regenerative? Sustainability as it's been practiced up until now has meant doing less harm and maintaining the status quo, but that's simply no longer enough. Science and our own common sense are telling us that we are approaching the limits of what our planet and our communities can endure. So we need to reverse the damage that's already been done and renew the resources that we're losing. In fact, our future depends on it. We're given this opportunity to change our extractive business models to regenerative approaches in order to ensure that we can continue to flourish on this planet. So what exactly do we need to regenerate? I'm going to share just a few slides with you. The problem is that industrial agriculture, as it's been practiced for about just over 50 years, has produced massive quantities of crops, but it's also caused damage, massive damage. Deforestation, desertification, loss of species, water contamination and depletion, and the list goes on, including impoverished farming communities, especially in South Asia. Did you know that India is losing 5,334 million tons of soil per year. This is according to a study I read that was conducted about 10 years ago. Now those numbers might have changed a little, but that's staggering. That's 30 to 40 times faster than in the US where I live. But this soil loss is happening around the world. Some have put the cost to South Asia alone at over 10 billion US dollars annually. You're literally losing your soil wealth. And over 90% of our food crops depend on healthy soil to grow. Next slide, please. This includes the food crops that we depend on for staple foods, as well as some of the products used in the natural products industry, including superfoods and tropicals, and especially the natural fibers that are used in textiles like cotton, hemp, and jute. They all depend on soil but by some estimates, we have less than 30 harvests left before our soils are depleted beyond repair. And even more shocking, along with losing that soil, we're releasing about 50 to 80% of the carbon that has been stored in it for millennia. That's about one quarter of the carbon that's been emitted by humans since the Industrial Revolution. Overall, the textile industry is responsible for a large portion of that. Next slide. In fact, textiles are responsible for about 10% of the total annual greenhouse gas emissions. And when you combine that with food, which is estimated to contribute about 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions, you can see that together these industries have a huge responsibility for climate change. According to the IPCC, we need to act now to avoid irreversible damage to ecosystems within about 11 years. And they've made it clear that carbon drawdown and sequestration are essential. We've passed the point where we can just reduce emissions and sustain what we've got. We need to regenerate and agriculture needs to play a major role according to their report. I also wanna point out when, that we need to contend with a looming water shortage on a global scale as well. And agriculture is responsible for about 70% of water consumption especially for thirsty crops like conventional cotton. These issues threaten farmer livelihoods, and that means that they create risk for both food and fiber industries. The declining productivity combined with rising input costs is creating poverty and financial strain, and many young people are leaving agriculture for jobs that they may or may not find in big cities. Anyhow, as you can see, we cannot continue along this path. We can't sustain a production system that's clearly in decline. These are powerful signals that are calling for system change. Next slide. We need to shift to a regenerative form of agriculture. 
And that's what I came to talk to you about. I'm here to offer solutions. Next slide. I'll share just a few of the compelling reasons why this should be one of the biggest solutions that we use to not only combat climate change, but deal with all of the other challenges I mentioned earlier. It turns out that soil can be restored through regenerative farming methods. And recent studies show that these practices could increase in soil organic matter, which is one of the key indicators of soil health and productivity from about one to 2% to 8% and even higher within a short span of five to 10 years. A 1% increase in soil organic matter can help hold over 232,000 liters of water per hectare. Regenerating soil will help restore the ecosystems we depend on and help reverse climate change. Now there are some debates about just how much carbon can be stored in the soil, but I wanna share a few of the well-respected figures with you. Some estimates say that three times more carbon could be stored in the soil using regenerative agriculture practices. And according to a brain trust called Project Drawdown, if regenerative agriculture were adopted on 1 billion acres over the next 30 years, we could offset nearly one third of the total carbon drawdown that we must achieve to restore climate balance. In 2004, Ratan Lal, who's a soil scientist in this field, estimated that these changes could return two thirds of all of the carbon lost from soils and store it productively back underground. And as I've mentioned, there are other benefits. Farmers see their profitability improve due to increased fertility and lowered input cost. And they also have more earning potential because they have more crops in production. These are very attractive benefits and companies, it turns out, can help drive this shift through the engine of their sourcing. Next slide. So I wanna share with you just a few of the key principles of regenerative farming. In short, it's a holistic approach to agriculture that leverages the power of photosynthesis in plants to build soil health. Regenerative practices include keeping the ground protected with cover crops, and growing multiple crops in rotations, including perennials and tree crops, keeping roots in the ground by reducing tillage, avoiding chemical pesticides and fertilizers, and integrating animals on farm <clears throat> for natural pest control, manure, and grazing. Next slide. These practices build uh, fertility and biodiversity, and they also reduce pest and weed pressure using natural systems. At first glance, this sounds like a pre-industrial approach to farming, the kind that's been practiced for millennia. But in fact, many in this movement are also applying new digital technologies to facilitate nature's processes. These include infield sensors, satellite imagery, drones, precision irrigation, and big data analytics that help provide real-time feedback to farmers to make better decisions. Next slide. Now I recognize that even if you're motivated by many of the benefits I've described, we work in companies that require a business case. So in this slide, I've outlined the triple bottom line business case for farmers, for companies like brands and consumer products companies, and for the environment. And I'm happy to elaborate on this during our discussion, but I think the points in these slides could be used by any business to quantify in their own context. Next slide. There are also very strong signals coming from consumers and investors that food and fashion companies in particular should demonstrate progress on environmental and social challenges. A majority of consumers wanna know where their ingredients come from and how they're produced, as well as the impacts that these products we buy and the companies that make them are having. Many surveys and analyses, especially now during this pandemic, show that companies and that are tackling these critical issues of our time are winning investor trust and consumer loyalty. So I want to inspire you. The companies that commit to source regeneratively produced materials demonstrate purpose and impact that those consumers and investors are looking for. They can help reduce those greenhouse gas emissions we've discussed, conserve water, protect biodiversity and improve livelihoods all while building their own resilience and reducing risks to the business. 
Next slide. Many companies and industries are recognizing this opportunity and this triple bottom line business case. It's created a movement really, and it's fast growing and global. I know I'm sharing uh, the logos of many North American based companies here, but as you can see, there are companies from around the world and many that do operate in India and South Asia. I'm showing just some of the key actors and they span food, fashion, and body care. I believe there's a very compelling reason for collaboration between these industries to support regenerative agriculture through sourcing because multiple crops that are used in both food and fiber can be commercially grown on these regenerative farms. For example, cotton. Over 50% of this crop is actually used in the animal and food stream, not just for textiles and clothing. And it can be grown in rotation with ginger, turmeric, lentils, and peanuts, depending where you are in the world. We're going to hear more about this later. Next slide. So I wanna take a quick couple of minutes to share that Interestingly, this very business-led regenerative movement um, is also recognizing the need for consistent definitions and standards to monitor the impacts of regenerative agriculture. There are four very well-respected frameworks or standards for regenerative agriculture that are emerging now, and I expect others will come soon. One is an assessment tool, two are verifications, and one is a full-fledged certification. All of these standards agree, or, or I should call them measurement frameworks because they're in various uh, structures, but they all agree on those core principles that I shared with you earlier about keeping the ground covered, minimizing chemical inputs, using natural systems to build fertility, crop rotations, etc. They differ in the way that they measure the impacts or prescribe practices, and they're different in a few of the impact goals. In full disclosure, we at NSF have worked with two of these. I think Rashmi mentioned that, but we're actually the program manager for Regenerative Organic Certified, and we helped to design the Soil Carbon Index. Now I want to dive into ROC, as we affectionately call it, the Regenerative Organic Certification Program. Next slide. This is a holistic standard and certification that's designed to promote the practices that will improve soil health, through ecological land management, plus pasture-based animal welfare and fairness for farmers and workers on farms. Next slide. These comprise the three pillars of the standard as you can see on the right here. In the spirit of continuous improvement, ROC goes beyond organic with additional requirements and also offers three levels of certification, bronze, silver, and gold. It's ethically guided and it aims to shift agricultural production to address those problems of industrial farming, help solve climate change, and offer economic justice, which makes perfect sense given that the founding partners and organizations behind this are very mission driven and they're known for high principles, namely Patagonia, Dr. Browners, and the Rodale Institute. Next slide. This program has been tested and trialed extensively with pilot audits that have been performed in very diverse farming contexts around the world. As you can see, there have been 19 organizations participating, and this represents 23 farms in seven countries. With audits that were conducted by four different certification bodies overseen by NSF and the governing body called the ROA, Regenerative Organic Alliance. And I'm pleased to say we've learned so much and that there are many crops and materials now in the marketplace. Next slide. All of these crops and materials have piloted this program, including rice and cotton grown in India, which you'll hear about shortly. Next slide, please. As a result, we've learned so much about what works and what needed to be improved but I'm happy to share that ROC is now open for participation and certified products will be entering the marketplace soon. You'll find many re useful resources on this website here, regenorganic.org, and you can apply online and receive a customized organic system plan, sorry, a regenerative organic system plan that you will complete 
There are many unique aspects to the program, which we won't go into at this moment, but those include soil sampling and monitoring. However, I think this new standard will best be explained by our guests today who went through the pilot themselves successfully just months ago. So I'm going to turn it over to Pratiba Syntax and Vasuda to share their experience incorporating regenerative agriculture into their business model and earning certification. Well, uh, thank you, Nova. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Suman and Dashmi for putting this together and giving us an opportunity to connect and speak uh, this evening. I think uh, some of the people present here know about Pratiba Syntex, and for those who don't, I'll give a very short uh, introduction. Pratiba Syntex was uh, started in 1997 with a very small spinning capacity of 25,000 spindles. Slowly, we learned and uh, you know uh, started apparel manufacturing from 2002. Driven by a pure passion and doing good for the farming community, our managing director, Shreska Chaudhary, started the farming project called Vasuda, which is a synonym for Mother Earth in our language. Having gone through its own ups and downs, Vasuda today has 17,000 organic farmers out of which 1,500 farmers are also fair trade certified and another 1,000 are on the way. Well, for us, our ROC journey began in 2018 in a conference at Patagonia headquarters in Ventura. After having spent a few hours and learning what all ROC has, I think it took us not even a second to decide and say, hey, yes, this, is what, this, is, this was exactly what we thought and always wanted to do. So who thought about and acted upon the fact that animals are a very important part of the farming ecosystem? Soil health, social fairness, and whatnot. This was the first time for us that a brand not only pioneered the program, but also partnered, invested, and committed to buy back. I especially want to thank Patagonia for making this change happen and partnering with us. Next slide. So as you can see, uh, we began with just 126 farmers in 2018, grew to 526 in 2019, and we were able to connect 1,000 farmers with ROC this year. And I simply say that this is one achievement that we will always be proud of. I will now hand over the mic to my colleague Avinash, who will take this further. Thank you so much. Avinash, it's over to you. Thanks, Atul. And hello, everyone. I'm Avinash. I'm working with Vasudha Farm Project of Pratiba now a little over six years. And I'm responsible for implementing all farm activities, practices with roughly 17,000 organic farmers. Uh, can I have next slide, please, Ryan? As Atul said, uh, we started our Vasudha Organic Projects 21 years back in 1999. Uh, and what we realized, like uh, in case of conventional or chemical farming, the focus was mainly on the crop-specific productivity. In that process, we ignored all components of agro-ecosystem and just remained focused on increasing specific crop productivity. And as already Noah uh, said, uh, which resulted in non-judicious use of water, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, weedicides, leading to high cost of production, degeneration of soil, and so many other things you already know. So all of us, you know, we are aware of the consequence of chemical farming. It takes 500 years of nature to make one inch of soil, and it took us just 50 years to make it dead. Then subsequently we realized this and the organic farming standards came with more focus on non-chemical inputs options such as bio inputs, bio fertilizers, non-GM organic seeds and some more amount of uh, crop rotations. But focus was mainly on reducing, eliminating chemical in agriculture and purpose was also good human health by providing chemical free crops. But regenerative organic, as 
name suggests it takes a more holistic approach including complete agro ecosystem soil animal and community all are so very interconnected and ignoring even one will not bring the desired impact soil too is a living entity and microorganisms and organic carbon are heart and soul of soil the this particular roc approach aims at improving organic carbon and microorganisms in soil and thereby infusing life back to soil animal and farming community which are integral part are also given due cognizance in the system so the standard provides uh, why why standards uh, so i was just wondering why standards so uh what we realized in uh, last couple of years that the standards provide a kind of well articulated framework to undertake various activities and uh, uh, this standard helped us to plan and implement them in various areas of agro ecosystem of course audit mechanism and monitoring system keep us on track consistently besides one important thing is standards give marketability to the idea and support from the brands to undertake the activities effectively on the field so why standards definitely they have these positive impacts which we experienced by having partner patagonia as atul already mentioned next slide please ryan now let me take you uh, through our three year uh, this is third year so two years completed uh, journey and our experience during this journey when we followed the protocol suggested in soil health and where we required to cover the land through cover crops have border crops and intercrops pollinator habitat and there are so many other things so and all these activities were mandatory so which helped us to think through think beyond and in this process uh, we in last three years identified uh, since we are more focused on cotton so i'm talking about uh, in context to cottons in last three years we identified more than 25 crops uh, as intercrop which can be sown with cotton and that includes everything legumes cereals spices horticulture vegetables floriculture so this increased the biodiversity and at the same time economic yield per acre here i am not talking about what is the productivity of a specific crop per acre but i am going to talk about the economic yield per acre so we are going to talk uh, later in this area so we introduced for example marigold so that is what as multi cropping pollinator habitat we introduced marigold which was initially used as pollinator habitat so uh, we did uh, we we sown maybe some 15 20 plants an acre but later developed it as a main crop and giving one more crop alternative to farmer against soybean uh, in this area soybean is usually grown uh, in this particular season so this marigold is an alternate crop which in our journey through roc was introduced with the farmers and there are a lot of benefits having marigold uh, as a main crop i'm going to talk about it later uh, besides this uh, another crop was sunflower which we introduced as a intercrop and pollinator habitat in the uh, wheat so that was the next season crop wheat there we introduced sunflower and uh, this sunflower uh, started giving them uh, availability of organic oil because each acre of sunflower produced roughly 100 uh, uh, kgs of the seed resulted in some 40 to 50 kgs of the oil which was sufficient for them for a family of the farmer for the entire year and the farmer who is organic now uh, is not supposed to buy conventional or chemical uh, oil from the outside he can have oil on his farm organic in this process uh, as uh, agroforestry is one important component uh, of roc standards uh, we planted in last three years roughly 10000 plants on the periphery that is the bunch of the uh, farms so i uh, i'm sure we, this is certainly going to help various ways economically as well as environmentally another thing uh, uh, which as a part of uh, roc program and as a part of standards so, uh, we uh, went to to do mass level rural waste recycling and use of same in agriculture definitely would improve in future organic carbon of the soil as i said this is going to be the heart and soul of the soil and that we're going to reinfuse in the soil using these rural waste 
to make availability of cow dung as an essential bio input because in india whenever we talk about the organic cow dung and cow urine become an essential bio input so, uh, we we natural focus was now on animal husbandry because they are so connected when i want to have the cow urine and cow dung naturally animal husbandry is going to be the part of the whole system so this gave us an idea uh, while we are implementing this program to integrate biogas to have a slurry as manure and gas for cooking purpose so this definitely having uh, this uh, uh, cow dung is being used in uh, uh, biogas this reduces the ghg emission and availability of renewable energy uh, the area we are working there are mostly tribes these tribes use wood for cooking uh, because they go to forest area and then they have those woods and they use it for the cooking purpose so eventually this is going to impact not only reduction of the wood cutting but at the same time smoke free cooking for the woman of the house giving health benefits so see this is how naturally all components of the ecosystem are so well connected and so positively affected through this particular program and of course soil testing because uh, being standard we have to be monitoring the things as i said soil testing uh, which uh, uh, this particular standard demands that in every 3 years uh, on the cluster basis we need to take the samples of the soil and keep track of the impact of soil organic carbon and other elements so he we hope that we'll see our soils getting their life back in future so next slide please right <clears throat> okay so now because we were talking about the triple uh, triple uh, bottom line impact and all those things how it affected to the farmers economics so that is also going to be really important uh, uh, all these help in increasing the economics of the farmer as well so you know in cotton their average net gains in two years increased by 20% from the base years and because we got production of multiple crops which were being uh, grown with the cotton so that resulted though the production of the cotton as such the productivity of cotton might have reduced by 10% but that 10% revenue is kind of compensated by other crops which are grown as intercrop so uh, final impact was in 2 years the base year uh, uh, the data 20 year 20% uh, net gain was grown in this process one important thing was uh, i was just telling about the marigold which we initially used as the pollinator habitat but now this is shown as the main crop giving revenue of inr 40000 per acre as against the crop soybean which otherwise is being shown by the farmer which gives 20000 per acre so it's just two times revenue increase for the farmer having this uh, crop we connected this uh, particular crop uh, production with the market as well Uh, for your information uh, a pharmaceutical company has tied up with us and they are buying this uh, marigold flower uh, organic marigold flower uh, from last two years which are being used in the eye care product for that pharmaceutical company so they got the market linkage uh, uh, as well and an alternative crop which is better than the previous crop that is soybean which otherwise they have been uh, uh, doing so this particular year out of 1000 farmers roughly 400 farmers are growing uh, marigold instead of soybean besides uh, you know when the uh, marigold is grown uh, after that the next crop is uh, usually wheat uh, so uh, it it was found that wheat crop sown next year after marigold gave roughly 20% more yield as marigold roots help to improve the soil productivity so, so this is how the whole ecosystem is connected uh, this is a very good example similarly as an endeavor to find various intercrops and cover crops we found turmeric not only gave more economic yield per acre when sown with cotton as intercrop but also became main crop which we vasudha our business bought that from the farmers and turmeric powder is being sold in the market so in this process of 2 years we identified two different crops which has the potential which have the potential to give uh, much more economic benefit to the farmer now as agroforestry we we have planted roughly 10000 uh, fruit trees on the bunch and uh, right now they are just 1 and 2 year old so we expect uh, that in next 3 to 5 years they are going to give additional revenue to the farmers once they start fruiting next slide please you know besides, uh, besides as natural part of standards a uh, natural focus gets on the animal husbandry because that was the requirement of the standards uh, which resulted in proper vaccination and health keeping for animals 
uh, we adopted one cow shed. If you know, uh, cow shed in India are uh, uh, the areas where uh, uh, all those discarded, non-productive or non-milking cows are kept. They are disowned by their owners. Uh, once they become non-productive so they are being kept uh, uh, in a particular location so they are well, we adopted one particular cow shed which has roughly 150 such cows and this particular cow shed is being used as community input to production center organic input production center so here we are producing organic inputs using that cow dance and uh, uh, cow urine so this is how this uh, produce input locally and consume locally definitely is going to be an advantage advantageous in many ways besides it also reduced the cost of inputs to the farmers by 30 to 40 percent because erstwhile uh, they they are to certain extent dependent on the market for buying these inputs now they are uh, getting this input manufactured locally so this has further reduced their cost of inputs by 30 to 40 percent so that was another economic uh, benefit they, they got and finally social aspects where farmer farming community becomes an essential component of the ecosystem uh, which usually has been ignored uh, uh, quite from quite some time we have done quite a few things in last two years because this is just a beginning so we could able to certain extent uh, we could just able to scratch the surface but still in last two years we we have done quite a bit of things in farming the women groups and uh, uh, aggregating them in a farmer producer company now in future this farmer producer company is going to do business for them by having primary uh, processing for their crops uh, maybe getting better value these women can be engaged in producing uh, organic inputs collectively that is going to be an additional income source for them so there are quite a few things we can uh, do uh, having this farmer producer company and uh, uh, self-help groups uh, in place but we have just started so we hope that uh, uh, in coming times this is going to uh, see a good impact on the community in terms of uh, gender equality, child, education, income, and so many other areas. Next slide, please. And now challenges. So naturally, this was a uh, new standards. There are so many things uh, put in place and we were supposed to follow that. So certainly, we we gone through quite a few challenges in first two years and we are still going through them. and. Hopefully, we'll mature ourselves to face those uh, challenges in coming times. So, uh, so first, cover crop. So, keeping land covered. What what standard demands that you need to keep the entire land covered round the year? And this is definitely a very difficult task. It first thing it makes intercultural operation in agriculture so difficult. And we actually don't have machineries, small machineries, which uh, which we don't have right now available. So it increases the labor requirement. So that definitely was a challenge. And in case of rain fed farmers where we don't have the water availability for almost four months uh, in a year, it becomes really tough to uh, keep the uh, land covered for those four months because there is no crop uh, on the land. Uh, we, we definitely, the uh, uh, NSF has addressed this particular uh, issue. And uh, I think uh, there is some revision in the standards. So. Uh, for uh, now for the bronze it has to be i think 30 percent area has to be covered uh, and same is for uh, silver some 50 percent and 70 percent for the gold standards crop rotation was again another essential requirement uh, and to get the gold standard it requires uh, that there has to be seven crop rotation so it becomes really difficult for a small farmer to have seven crop rotation and we also have our interest being a textile company uh, uh, we we need cotton every year, so so it, it is going to be a bit difficult. Uh, let's see how it turns up uh, when we move forward in the process. Tillage is one more thing because uh, uh, to get gold standard, we required no tillage. The soil need not be uh, tilled uh, during the process. Uh, so that is definitely uh, one of the toughest thing which I uh, as an implementer find having no tillage. So. To get the gold standard, we don't have to till the soil, and that seems to be a distant target for at least uh, for us at this point of time. So let's see, because every year we have multiple crops, and uh, the aim to reach to no tillage level uh, uh, seems uh, quite a bit uh, difficult. Another challenge we face that uh, there were standards, uh, uh, there were some clauses of the standards. There was no rationale or context was being given 
uh, for having those uh, standards or those clauses in place so sometimes it leaves to uh, leaves to the um, uh, discretion of the auditor uh, for example similarly crop rotation uh, because there is so much of intense cropping if you are sowing 10 to 12 crops along with the cotton uh, so do we really need that crop rotation because concept of the crop rotation has evolved from monocropping system we already have 10 to 15 crops in one particular piece of land do we need, really need that so that kind of uh, rationale is uh, not really uh, was not really available uh, in first two years so that uh, uh, that gave a bit of uh, challenges to us uh, uh, to understand the standard when there is uh, so the, we find some gaps uh, when we are implementing and standards definitely they are still to mature and get refined with the times uh, so i think these uh, problems will get resolved <laughs> and i think that's it uh, lastly uh, i would just like to mention that uh, in these three years of experience with the roc uh erstwhile also we had this uh, conviction and uh, this is uh, reinforced and now we are stronger in our conviction that there is no more option but sooner or later one has to shift to regenerative practices then only we will be really able to bring life back to our soil mother earth as we meant when we say Basuda. So I think that's it uh, from my end. Thanks and over to you, Nova. Thank you so much. As I said, uh, this, uh, this information is probably what we all came on the line to hear today. It's so incredible mm -hmm. what Pratiba and Basuda learned through this experience and all of the benefits that they've described. Again, that triple bottom line case is really evident that being said, there are some challenges. I recognize that. Um, and the Regenerative Organic Alliance has worked very hard to update the standard based on everything that was learned and the feedback that was shared from Vasuda and Pratiba and all of the other pilots. Um, but I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague Rashmi uh, because we wanted to discuss this a little bit and also incorporate the questions that you have chatted in. Rashmi? Yeah, thanks, Noah. Uh, Atul, thanks Avinash as well. Uh, you have given a very good insight about regenerative agriculture to us, and uh, definitely it is it is it has given a fair idea to us about ROC certification, the business model, benefit to the farmers and benefit to the communities, uh, and also to the environment. To continue the conversation here, I would like uh, I would uh, uh, like to ask a few questions from all of you. Uh, probably um, I can go with you, Nova, first. Um, um, how the region is different in the organic agriculture? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Well, organic certification is a base foundation of the standard. Um, you can learn more about that online, as I described, but that's a baseline requirement. But ROC, uh, as we affectionately call it, goes beyond organic. Um, first off, I'd point out the fact that there are three pillars to the standard, soil health and then animal welfare and fairness for farmers and workers. For most of the organic standards around the world, fairness for farmers and workers is really totally beyond the scope of organic. Um, most organic standards around the world are focused on minimizing chemical inputs. But as we described, it's a much, rock is a much more holistic approach. So there are very specific requirements in the soil health pillar around cover crops. Um, and uh, Atul and Amitash just shared with us some of the details around that. So uh, the vegetative cover, cover crops, the number of rotations that are used, those are specified and those need to increase over time as an organization moves through the levels. So that's another really important difference between uh, rock and organic. This this focus on continuous improvement over time. Um, there are also very specific indicators of soil health that are measured through soil testing, which you won't find um, explicitly in most of the organic standards around the world. Well, that's great. Um, I would like to ask the next question uh, to Avinash. Um, Avinash, as you have completed the first pilot of ROC, and I think you were also telling in your uh, presentation that uh, there is a change in the yield and there is improvement, uh, there is a drop and there is improvement into the income with the pollination or multi-crops. 
So uh, what is your observation? What was the drop in the initial year for the yield and how it has improved in further years? Can you uh, share your video? Yeah, uh, sure, sure, sure. Atul also. Yeah. So uh, one, uh, I think I have already mentioned that here we aren't being uh, uh, the, the production specific because that has been uh, the challenge in conventional farming where we just uh, talked about a crop specific production. Here we are talking about uh, uh, the economic yield per acre because I said uh, in my uh, presentation that maybe 10% 10, 10 of the cotton production might have reduced per acre. Uh, but uh, that has been compensated by 20% more crops, maybe whatever intercrops were, were there. So uh, if I consider as an economic yield per acre rather than just a particular crop being grown because farmer is not uh, anyway interested in uh, 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 the, the, the kgs, uh, rather he's more interested in how much is the economic yield you, you get. And I have already mentioned 20% uh, net gain are increased in this particular process in just two years. So that is, I think, a uh, good example. That's that, really uh, great. It's not reduced. Yeah. Awesome. It's a motivation to come to this movement, in fact. Yeah. Uh, again, to say, again, one more question for you, Avinash. Um, uh, how uh, do you feel uh, it is go really helping to the environment also? I think, of course, uh, there is no doubt about uh, that. Uh, if I just talk about the GNG mission, that's a small thing I'm going to take. There is minimum tillage requirement that is going to reduce the GNG. Carbon sequestration process will get improved with the simple process. Organic carbon is going to improve. As I said, this is going to be uh, heart and soul of the soil. Microbial population will certainly improve because when we are going to have more number of uh, crops per acre, uh, uh, intercrops per acre, uh, per piece of the land. If we have uh, more land covered by uh, cover crops, this is certainly going to improve the uh, microbial population. So another thing is uh, when water is being used judiciously in this process, so because more water retention capacity will be there for such uh, organic systems, such uh, uh, system where we have multiple cropping. So that is going to reduce the requirement of the uh, water so that certainly will result into uh, lesser uh, carbon emission uh, because the water is another reason for this so there are so many so many ways i think uh, it is affecting the environment and collectively it's not only have the positive footprint on the environment but more important on the community as a whole the, because ultimately they are the flag keepers they are the people who are going to take this forward so it is positively mm -hmm. impacting them as well that's great yeah and uh, again coming back to you nova um uh, what does the roc certification brings for me as a farmer a brand or a manufacturer is it uh, really going to give some value addition to a brand or uh, we can say that uh, um, uh, compared to organic or bci cotton hmm. can this be called a more sustainable material than that hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is a ROC is a new framework in the marketplace, but the marketplace is building and there already have been strong signals, as I mentioned briefly, from consumers and from investors that brands, particularly in food and textiles, need to demonstrate responsibility and action on some of these big global challenges that we're facing, like climate change, uh, loss of biodiversity, natural resources and just a, a general sense of purpose and responsibility towards the society that our businesses operate in. Um, and that's borne out by so many analyses and studies of what's going on both in the marketplace uh, from an investor point of view, as well as in the marketplace from consumers, people like you and I, we want to be empowered through the purchases that we're making to feel like we also are part of a, of a cycle that allows us to purchase products that are doing better for the planet and better for humanity. Um, so I, I'm not gonna get into all the details and statistics around that, but there's a majority of consumers in most of the surveys now, especially in the younger generations that are demonstrating this not only with their intent, but also it's, it's happening at purchase. Now, it's a growing movement, right? But um, I think that's a really compelling 
value proposition for brands um, and CPG companies across all the industries that we discussed. The other one, of course, is managing risk. Investors are looking for risk management right now. And again, the, the coronavirus pandemic has shown a spotlight on all of the risks that we're facing. Um, and investors are looking for companies to demonstrate that they're managing and reducing those risks. Uh, so the risk to supply of materials and inputs from around the world has been borne out during this pandemic. And there's an opportunity with regenerative sourcing to build much stronger, more long-lasting, long-term relationships with suppliers um, that are mutually beneficial. As, as we heard from our panelists, the improved profitability for farmers is a huge value proposition that helps ensure that those farmers will stay in production for the long term so that brands can rely on the materials that they're sourcing. Um, anyway, we could talk about this for hours, but I think those are really important aspects of value. There's another yeah. question related to, uh, related to brands. There's another question, uh, which uh, fashion brands have adopted ROC? For example, uh, is there uh, CA? Uh, you already mentioned about Patagonia, but H&M or uh, Primark or uh, Inditex, CNA, any any one of them? Mm -hmm. any so of I will the answer brands? this question, uh, Dr. Suman. Okay. Uh, we, yes. Uh, this was definitely uh, you know started by Patagonia. Uh, we already have uh, Timberland on board. And uh, we are going to have Chibo uh, on board very soon uh, within the next couple of days. So these are the three brands that have come on board with us for ROC. And there are a few more dialogues going on. We are seeing that uh, definitely by next year, they will also be on board. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Pratibha, you. You ha Rashmi, you had uh, something? Yeah, um, I have one more question to Atul only. I think you can continue. I uh, just wanted to know uh, for this first pilot production, which you have produced um, uh, the brands or the labor have any specific labeling guidelines for ROC products have the brands given any specific labeling guideline are we using the ROC label from well, definitely uh, yeah so uh, the way it works uh, in the ROC framework is you know uh, to be able to uh, label the car apparel uh, you, you have to be on a, a silver uh, level so we started with the bronze level and pending the fair trade audit uh, because of the uh, corona uh, pandemic the uh, uh, audit got delayed so once uh, that audit is cleared and pay trade certified uh, the brands working with us will be able to label their product as a silver uh, category so that's how it's going to work and if uh, we qualify for gold for sure uh, they can label it as a gold certified that's it encouraging there's a question in the chat box. Uh, this is from uh, Lena uh, Piper from Gots. Uh, uh, you have shown this is for Nova. You have shown uh, the th other three frameworks presented next to the ROC uh, and uh, which have organic principles as a baseline. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this, does the same ROC, is it the same? Okay, I, I think I understand the question. Yeah, this is a very unique aspect of ROC, this organic baseline requirement, and yet ROC moves beyond organic. I showed that slide, um, Ryan, I don't know if you want to pop it up, but those other frameworks that are out in the marketplace don't specify organic production and they don't specify organic certification as a base. However, I will say all of them agree on this principle of regenerative agriculture that we should be striving to reduce chemical inputs and use natural fertility. Um, yeah, here it is. So um, these are just examples of what's emerging, but, uh, but ROC is unique in that organic baseline requirement. And, and we recognize um, the founders of ROC and the governing board recognize that um, you know, it's a journey um, I also prepared a slide, I think, towards the end, Ryan, just in case this came up, that shows the journey all the way from conventional ag through to uh, ROC. And that journey includes, you know, going through a period of um, transition to organic, through organic certification and layering on some of the practices that Avinash mentioned so eloquently 
um, you know, over a span of perhaps five to six years. So it doesn't happen overnight if you're starting from a conventional base, but as they have demonstrated, it's totally possible. Uh, another uh, question. Do you think uh, it's going to be a greenwashing instead of a genuine effort of increasing truly sustainable fibers used in fashion in particular? I will defer to the industry experts on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Atul and Avinash. I and think Rafa. Atul would be the right person to answer. Yes. I'll just Atul explain Gigi. from my end because I am the person who is to put. Uh, let me let me put the uh, question properly because yeah, okay. the companies of everyone are committed. All the brands are committed to use sustainable fibers every single year, year on year increase. When you look at the organic cotton, fair trade cotton use in articles finally it's not increasing what is increasing is bci cotton now we have roc mm. and reality is that roc could be really answering all the issues of sustainable fiber and forestry biodiversity everything and are we really going to actually look at after five years are we going to see the increase of consumption by the fashion brands and not just the patagonias and and the vfs because these are known to be used like even ellen fisher or uh, ellen MacArthur, these people would be definitely using it but when it comes to the local local brands like pratiba like uh, arvin or like uh, even our uh, aditya birla these people when they start using it because their final number of their commitments to climate change requires this kind of commitment that's something when we need these uh, the standards to be improved otherwise what happens is they will use a percent of it and then they will claim that they are all using it and then it will become a greenwashing uh, statement so i will I uh, answer this yeah yeah we did okay yes um, i think atul can add to something okay so uh, you are right, Dr. Shiva. Uh, you know, the, unfortunately, uh, most of the brands across the world, you know, uh, it's the, the entire market is very price sensitive. The I think the one main reason why PCI has grown uh, so uh, big is uh, that it does not have any cost impact on the final price of the fiber. Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, most of the uh, brands are, you know. This is, I can say, this is unfortunate that uh, they uh, they want to do the uh, sustainability uh, talk, but uh, you know they don't want to pay the price for that. So this is something that has to be understood by all the brands in the world that sustainability will happen, but only if they are willing to partner for it. If they are only willing to make it happen, uh, I think uh, uh, consumers are really willing to pay uh, for the uh, you know right product. But uh, then the brands really have to uh, agree to this and push this uh, the way uh, you know the BCI has been pushed into the supply chain. So this cost element is, I think, the most important part that needs to be taken care of and uh, needs to be agreed by all the brands. I think I, I answered your question. In the I'd like to chime in on that too because, as I mentioned, there's a there are a few really interesting economic opportunities with a regenerative organic system um, and through regenerative organic sourcing. So as you mentioned, these farmers are now growing multiple crops in a rotation, which is providing all of these profitability and productivity benefits to them. But it also means that there are other ingredients and materials that are available in the marketplace that are certified. And I'm very interested in working on a coalition or coordination between food and fiber and supplements, as you mentioned, so that that cost of goods, that premium for ROC certified is not full falling solely on the cotton crop, but now that premium can be spread and, and let's say, you know, lower on each of those individual crops that are being produced. And this is being borne out just a little bit in the example of Patagonia and Patagonia provisions who are sourcing 
multiple ingredients, right? Um, so there's a really interesting opportunity. Yes, there we should all be willing to pay a bit more for these um, social environmental benefits because we're paying for them elsewhere right now. We just don't realize it. <laughs> They're outside of the cost of goods. Um, but that being said, that could be spread across, you know, multiple industries and multiple crops in a regenerative organic system. So there's an opportunity there. Fully agree with you, Noah, on that. I think with that, uh, we have come to the end of the questions. Uh, I don't see any more in the chat box. We have a few more questions here, but in the interest of time, I think uh, we can go back to questions individually later. Um, there are many questions here, and uh, we can answer them uh, individually separately so that, because we are already. Yeah, we have time. some time. Yeah. Oh, so uh, let me end. I thank you all uh, for making this so interesting and interactive. Uh, I thank uh, Noah Sears. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abhinash Karvatkar, Mr. Atul Mittal, and Rashmi for coordinating all the entire uh, series. And uh, thank you, Pratibha Syntex and uh, NSF International for partnering with SDC. So, on behalf of SDC, I thank you all for making this a uh, successful webinar. Thank you, participants, for your uh, interest and uh, your patience. Thank you. And please provide your feedback uh, on the given link below. You can scan the. Thank you, Dr. Suman. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great to Bye -bye. speak with you all today. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Have a nice evening ahead.